Okay, thank you, Courtney. So um, today I'm really going to want to try and just touch on two topics of uh, some work that actually spans a number of um, GRDC projects that, uh, that we work on. Um, one of them is around what's happening with pre-emergent herbicides and uh, what we might be able to do about that. And the second one is looking more at uh, broadleaf weed, uh, weed resistance, um, particularly um, to the phenoxy herbicides. And again, you know, what we know about how we can manage those problems. So to start off, I'm going to talk about our, our weed surveys that we do at the end of each, uh, each year where we go out into farmers' paddocks and collect their weeds and test them for resistance. And in 2017, we were through the South Australian Mallee and South East. Um, that were the locations we went to. Every one of those dots is a paddock we visited. And all up, we collected almost 200 samples of ryegrass, but we collected a range of other weeds as well. Now, I'm only going to talk about our ryegrass results and about our broadleaf weed results um, from the surveys. Um, we also tested barley grass, wild oats, brome grass. If you're interested in any of those, um, you can come and see me afterwards, and I'll tell you what, what we found with those. So, with the ryegrass, um, over the years, um, what's tended to happen is that we get asked to test more and more herbicides. Um, it almost seems that everybody, every time I talk to the Southern panel about this, they go, what about this herbicide? Can you test that as well? Um, and it's got to the point now where ryegrass is so, our testing for ryegrass is so large that I can't fit it all on one slide, so you're going to get two slides. This is the post-emergent herbicide results that we had, and a lot of this won't be... Uh, a huge surprise to many of you. Um, so we got the, the two Mallee um, set up, so the Northern Mallee, so that's the part up around um, uh, Wakery and Loxton. Um, the Southern Mallee, that's Pinaroo and Lamaru area, uh, and then the Southeast. Uh, the Group A herbicides, um, down in the Southeast, they more or less don't work anymore, is probably the best description. Um, with Clethodim, we're looking at um, 500 grams Per, uh, per hectare of, um, or 500 mil, a big pardon, of he per hectare of clethodim in pots here. Um, and that's at three leaf ryegrass stage. So it works a whole lot better than it tends to do in farmers' fields. So you'll go, oh yeah, but I'm you know, seeing a lot of clethodim resistance. Um, you know, these numbers are going to be a little bit um, underestimating the full uh, extent of the problem. But what it does mean, though, is you actually still get some activity out of clethodim. So even though it's not killing the ryegrass, it's still tending to stunt it up a bit. And it can still be a valuable um, part of, um, of weed management for ryegrass. The Group B herbicides, um, more or less everywhere, we get um, lots of resistance to the SUs. We also have resistance to intervix. And what we tend to see with ryegrass is it's about even. So if the SUs aren't working, intervix is probably not going to work. Probably the uh, uh, big one that we would get worried about is glyphosate in the southeast. A quarter of the paddocks that we went into we were able to collect glyphosate resistant ryegrass out of. Um, and, you know, that has been something that's been growing over time. Um, and it is an issue that we, we're going to be facing in terms of uh, how well glyphosate is going to work for us. It's by no means, you know, sort of the end of the world for, for glyphosate because, you know, we would probably find glyphosate quite easily in, in, in paddocks elsewhere. And one of the things that, that certainly had feedback about um, glyphosate resistance and its management is that once we fix the fence line problem, once growers fix the fence line problem, the glyphosate resistance in the paddock is much less of a problem because all their other management strategies are actually helping to control it. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, three leaf for glyphosate, and that um, oh, I can't remember exactly what the rate is, but it's either it's either a liter or a liter and a half, so it's a good rate of glyphosate. It's not we're not mucking about there. Um, but this one, we're actually able to pick up paracot resistance in uh, in ryegrass in the southeast, and we know that there is some paracot resistance down there because we've had samples sent to us, but this is the first time we've really turned it up in our surveys, um, and so we've got situations where you know, neither of those um, pre-sowing herbicides are, are going to work on some ryegrass populations. And that just means I think growers are going to have to work extra hard to get um, control of those. So that's the post-emergence. If we uh, move to the pre-emergent herbicides, I think this is where some of the perhaps are the more um, concerning actions happening. 
Um, one of the things that's true of pretty much all of South Australia is that we get um, trifluorine resistance more or less wherever we go. Not so high in the northern Mallee, and that's because ryegrass isn't their main her, um, weed of um, target up there. They're more targeting things like brown grass, and that requires a different mix and, um, of herbicides. So, you know, some of these herbicides don't get the same sort of pressure they get elsewhere. But down in the southern Mallee, um, trifluorine resistance is a, is a very large problem. Uh, when we get down to the southeast, uh, we've actually seen trifluorine resistance fall in the southeast. Uh, and this is probably a reflection of the fact that most of the growers down there are actually using other herbicides. They're using all the new chemistry. Uh, and we're starting to see resistance to this new chemistry come up. And in fact, um, of all of these um, herbicides, the only one that controlled all of the uh, ryegrass populations was um, propizomide. So we've got resistance to the, um, the Ds, the Js, and the Ks uh, in that area. And um, that's been probably been the big, um, the big change we've seen in the last few years is this, um, we're now detecting in our surveys resistance to the group K chemistry. So pre-emergent herbicides are um, going to be something that's going to be a little bit troubling. And, you know, we've um, doing some work to try and understand how resistance is happening, what sort of resistance we're getting, what can you do about it. I'm just going to show you a couple of little bits about the, some of the sort of resistance we're getting to J's and K's. I'm not going to talk about this in any great detail because David Brunton's going to be talking about it after afternoon tea. And if you want to know all the ins and outs, you can go to that. Um, but I really want to talk about it much more in terms of how can we understand what we do about this and what the management might be. So these are two herbicides. This is trilate. These are just our dose response um, curves. Um, that's your field right there. And these are two susceptible populations. And we've got a range of resistant populations here. And they're all quite resistant to trilate. And in fact, they're quite resistant to um, arcade, just prosulfocarb. They're also resistant to boxagol these populations. So what we're seeing with these is we're getting, you know, broad spectrum resistance across the group J's. And when we looked at them against the group K's, we saw that many of them are also resistant to group K chemistry. Um, I'm only going to show you Sakura here. Um, that's peroxisulfone. Here's our field rate here. And we have the setables here. And then we have these populations which are not quite as susceptible, but we control with the field rate. And so mostly out in the field, you'd get those, except under conditions where um, they were difficult for Sakura to work. So dry conditions, they might fail. But then we've got a few populations out here where we're getting between 10 and 25% survival at the field rate in pots where everything's going right for them. And so they're the concerning ones. When we start looking across these um, herbicides in Group K, these populations are a lot more resistant to esmetolachlor and to metazachlor than they are to Sakura, peroxisulfone. So we actually have some variation there. But we don't understand why it is, but we're getting this cross resistance between the group J's and K's, and it's a little bit variable. So just to show you what they look like, um, this is trilate resistant. This is just one of the resistant populations, two of the susceptibles. There's your field right there. Um, got survivors at the field rate, two times the field rate, four times the field rate, and there's the, even the odd plant sitting out there at eight times the field rate uh, in that population. So, you know, increasing the rate on these ones is not going to get us anywhere. Um, this is um, Sakura. Here's your field rate here. Um, few survivors at the field rate. You get to two times the field rate, and we've killed them. So they don't have high levels of resistance. And then this gives us an opportunity because we might be able to use some mixtures to get over the top of the resistance for these, um, these group um, K resistant populations. So there might be some opportunities to do something about those. Um, but we're getting a lot more variation than that. So going back to our survey, this is just a, a single um, set for three different herbicides out of our survey. These are exactly the same field samples. Um, from the southeast of trifluralin, box of gold, and Sakura, and quite a lot of resistance to the trifluralin here. But when you look at box of gold, there's a lot less, but we've got this one here, which is um, not very resistant to trifluralin, but resistant to box of gold. Um, we've got this one up here, 
about the same. And then we've got Sakura, we've got these two populations up here. And this one here actually turned out not to be um, resistant to any of the other pre-emergent herbicides. So suddenly what we're seeing is the patterns can be much more variable than we thought. Uh, and to put that into, into context, I've just taken 13 of the resistant populations that are giving us some different patterns out of that southeast survey, and the red is where we've got resistance. So if we look at our herbicides, um, trifluralin, um, lots of them have resistance, we have some that don't, and trifluralin-resistant ones, we can have resistance to Avidex, we might have resistance to Arcade, we might have resistance to Sakura, we might have resistance to Butazan, so we might have resistance to just about everything. And then we've got populations that don't have resistance to trifluralin, but are resistant to Avidex, and Arcade, Sakura and Butazan. And then we have populations that don't have resistance to anything but Avidex and Box of Gold, but Arcade works. So that's not to say, these are all done with a single rate, so that's not to say that if we went below the label rate, we mightn't pick up the resistance of there. Um, but what it means is that the resistance we're seeing from field populations is actually quite variable. And we can't go and say, well, if we've got resistance to this herbicide, you're definitely going to have resistance to that herbicide in the way that we've been able to do it with some of our other modes of action. The one piece of news I can say is that whilst some of the populations we're looking at have some low-level propizomide resistance, we aren't finding that yet in our field samples. So propizomide is going to work most of the time. So the one piece of news you can take back from this is that, yes, you can still use propizomide. It's probably going to be the, the uh, product of choice uh, in your pulse part of the rotation. Um, elsewhere, well, we have to get more information. And I think that um, this is going to be one of the circumstances where testing is really going to help us. So if you've got farmers with problem paddocks, it might be worthwhile getting a test across the pre-emergent herbicides just to find out what still works in that paddock and to be able to make some better decision about um, the choices of products that that, uh, that farmer has as part of their rotation. Because I can't tell you, I can't stand up, you can't call me up and go, Chris, I've had a failure to box of gold, what's going to work? The only one I can be co reasonably confident about is that propizomide's going to work. So we need more information. And we'll certainly be trying to get as much a handle on this as much as possible, but I think you need to get some tests under your belt, get a bit of confidence yourself about making recommendations to your growers. Um, so leading on from that, um, um, David Brunton uh, has been running a couple of field trials uh, where we've been asking the question, you know, if we do have um, resistance to these herbicides, what can we use? So Last year, had a couple of trials uh, on the York Peninsula, and before those, David collected some seed heads out of the trial area, tested them, and these populations were resistant to groups D, J, and K. And so, in the trial, what we did was we used groups D, J, and K, um, which I'm going to show you here, because we really wanted to get into grips with what could we do. So. We look at the, we've got a whole range of products here, and I'll go through those a bit later. Um, we've uh, measured weeds in crop, and we've measured the uh, number of amount of seed set we're getting at the end of the season to give us a bit of a handle on, um, you know, some weeds in crop might not be a problem in terms of ryegrass population. Um, big populations we're starting with. And, you know, at Pascaville, trilate didn't work, trifluralin didn't work, trifluralin plus trilate didn't work, um, sulfur carb wasn't that flash, uh, box of gold was okay, um, Sakura didn't work. Um, but then we got down into some of these mixtures and some of those worked um, reasonably well. Now, one thing to remember about this is that last year we had really difficult conditions to get pre-emergent herbicides to work. It was dry uh, around sowing time and sometimes for some time afterwards, and that's one of the reasons why Sakura struggled. Uh, Box of gold is often better in those circumstances. Um, at Arthurton, population wasn't quite as resistant to trilate, um, so we see some lower weed numbers, but pretty much the same sort of pattern. Once we're getting down to, so this is uh, Sakura plus Box of gold as a um, mixture in front, you know, that was probably the best that we could do 
with the DJ and K mix in a year like that. Seat set, similar sort of stories, but notice things like that even though we didn't get very good control with Sakura, we're actually managing to reduce seed set with it. So it's one of the nature of that herbicide with its long persistence that in dry conditions we can escape, but they don't necessarily go on to set a lot of seed. Um, and what that means, of course, is that when we get down to um, Sakura mixtures down the bottom here, um, they were some of the better um, treatments we had. Now, we did have a whole lot of other stuff um, in this trial that's currently not registered. Um, and I could tell you all about that, but you're not going to be able to use any of that till at least 2021. So I'm not going to tell you at the moment what those were and how they went, but as those products come to market, we'll certainly talk about how they perform on these resistant populations. But for the moment, your best bet, if you've got populations that these pre-emergent herbicides are not working the way they should work on, is you're probably going to be looking at heading down the bottom here and having those mixtures. Mixtures of two pre-emergent herbicides are probably going to be your best bet. And then using things like crop competition and harvest weed seed management to, um, to help manage that population um, until we get some, some new things we can do. OK, so the other part of this is that if we've got resistance to DJs and Ks and we're going to do some mixtures, then how do you actually rotate your chemistry? What are the options for doing that? And the way that I've been thinking about this is that I've actually been thinking about what our current pre-emergent options are for all of our, the crops that we have in our rotation and what we can use where. And so probably the, you know, the space to start looking at is in Bali where, in fact, if we don't have trifluralin, it really doesn't work in most of South Australia. You know, and there, you know, the Group J is going to do, have to do the heavy lifting in the barley phase. It's really the main thing that's going to actually be working on ryegrass that we can put out there. Um, and then when we start looking over at wheat, if we're going to be using J and barley, um, you know, we probably want to be perhaps using some more K or perhaps some J and K or some D and, um, D and K in our wheat phase. So if we're going to use the trifluralin, um, box of gold, arcade, sakura in these phases, when we come over to these phases, we probably want to use less of that mode of action. And so I'm going to talk about the pulses. The pulses are where we've got the most opportunity. So the D in pulses is propizomide, and it works on most of the trifluralin-resistant populations. So we can certainly use that. And we can use um, group Cs to top that up. Um, you can use Js and Ks. Um, if you're growing faba beans, you can use terrain. Uh, it won't give you enough control on its own. You'll have to add something to it, uh, which is why I've got a plus there, but I haven't specified what you might add to it. Um, but if you're going to use the wheat rate, you're going to use the cereal rate, it won't give you ryegrass control of, of anything to speak of. So that higher rate that you can use in faba beans gives you something, but you'll need something else. So, you know, over in this pulse phase, you know, the Ds and Cs are probably what you want to be doing and maybe keep away from the Js and Ks to allow you to use them over in the cereal phase. So we want to be thinking about having those mixtures there, but then trying to rotate. And I think, at least for the next little while, try and set up a system where you don't use any mode of action more than twice in, say, four years. Might be the way you might think about that. So it's going to be a lot more challenging. OK, that's enough for ryegrass. Um, I'm going to finish up and tell you a little bit about what's happening in broadleaf weeds. Um, so this is our survey results um, around broad broadleaf weeds, at least the ones that had resistance. We collected some others. Um, and the three weeds that we got with resistance were sow thistle, which was present in both the Mallee and the southeast, uh, wild radish present in the southeast, and wild turnip, which was just in the Mallee. Uh, and if we start with sow thistle, you know, lots of resistance to the group B herbicides, but the big thing that's changed in recent um, years is they've suddenly all got resistance to the IMI chemistry as well as the SUs. So using IMI herbicides has pushed sow thistle to resistance very, very quickly. And so if you go to the Mallee, you know, basically group B herbicides just don't work on, on sow thistle at all. We're starting to pick up, even in the Mallee, 
we're starting to pick up resistance to 2,4-D. Now, it was only a few years ago we got our first sample sent to us from the southeast that had resistance to 2,4-D. Now we're starting to get a lot of samples in our random surveys. So this is something that's moving fairly quickly, at least in that area. Um, over at Wild Radish, things are a little bit different. So in the southeast, about half of them resistant to chlorosulfuron, but only about half of those are resistant to the ME chemistry. So with radish, SU resistance might still mean you can use IMIs if you've got the right population. But 38% resistant to 2,4-D. So 2,4-D resistant radish is, again, something that's moving fairly quickly. We've had it in Victoria for a few years, and we've had the odd population in South Australia. Now we're starting to get lots of those. So that's something that's, um, that's again, this... Um, Phenoxy resistance is really um, coming to the fore now. Um, while turn it in the Mallee, you're getting resistance to both the SUs and the IMIs, largely because most of the selection pressure at the moment is coming from the IMI chemistry. So the use of Intervix in, in various clear field crops. So when we start thinking about what we're seeing with um, phenoxy resistance, we see two types of phenoxy resistance that I call low-level resistance and high-level resistance. It's they're, they're fairly obvious. Um, but in fact, the reason for distinguishing this is that there are probably different management strategies for the two of them. Now, everything we've seen so far in South Thistle, I would describe as being low-level resistance. Most of what we've seen in Indian Heads Mustard is high-level resistance. And radish is the one that does a bit of both. And so this is some um, data on wild radish populations. There's our susceptible there, gets controlled. This is the low-level resistance. And when we get out at the field rate, we're getting you know, somewhere between 0 and 20% survival. And this is what they often look like. Really stunted up, but they're not dead. And as soon as... Um, they get a chance, they just grow up and set seed, flower and set seed. We've got a lot of that. There's a lot of this low-level 2,4-D resistance around in radish. And the beauty of that is that it's relatively straightforward to control with either mixtures. So you can go for a mixture with something else with 2,4-D. We'll take that out. And competition. So you shouldn't actually be able to have those set any seed in cereal crops if you get it right. So they're pretty straightforward to control. This high-level resistance, um, you know, we're still getting 50% survival at the field rate, and this is what they look like. Okay, so these are plants where you spray them with 2,4-D, um, they look a bit funny for a couple of days, like they've had a bit of a cold, and then they just grow on. They're virtually untouched. Uh, so this is five weeks after application of um, 2,4-D. Those ones are a lot harder for us to manage. Um, where we've done some work in Victoria a few years ago looking at what the strategies might be, um, we borrowed the strategy from WA, which was a two-spray strategy. You go for a contact herbicide first, so that'll be something like Velocity or Calinor or one of those contact herbicides first. And you go early because you need to be treating small plants and you need to be able to get through the canopy. And then you come back later with a second spray where you're going to have something that's a bit systemic in it because you're not going to get as good a coverage, and that often means a phenoxy. So we were doing things like, you know, velocity followed by flight and those sorts of strategies, and it's, um, you know, anything that's contact first and systemic second will work. Um, and the beauty of that is the product with a phenoxy in it works better because you're treating smaller radish because you got rid of that first flush. You're really only treating that second flush. Uh, and then you can add, you know, other things to that if you want. Um, you know, windrow burning and those sort of things could be really good for, for radish as well. But it's that two-spray approach that really worked on these um, phenoxy-resistant populations. So, you know, there's different choices to be made depending a bit on what the population looks like and how it behaves. And you can tell by going out, um, say, 10 days after or two weeks after the spray and just seeing what the remaining radish looks like. If it's a bit twisted and beaten but still alive, it's one of these. If it's just looks like it's never been sprayed, it's going to be one of these. 
Okay, so I'm going to finish up there. Um, that were the two things that I wanted to talk about, and I'm happy to have some questions, open that up for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for that.